Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure and my privilege to welcome you to the first session of our Sustainable Development Goals webinar series. I'm Christoph Heider, President of the European Chamber of Commerce in Korea. Sustainability is a key focus area at our chamber. That's why, in order to promote the SDGs and to make a broader audience aware of those, we have invited 10 global CEOs to share their insights today and the next coming months. Today, I'm very glad and also a bit excited that we have Lorenzo Simonelli, Chairman, President and CEO of Baker Huge, as our speaker. Nevertheless, before we start with Lorenzo, I would like to invite a very special guest to deliver some remarks on the Sustainable Development Goals. I think there is no one better than Ban Ki-moon, as he was the main driving force behind the adoption of the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda and the 17 SDGs when he was Secretary General of the United Nations. It is a great honor to have Ban Ki-moon supporting the ECCK SDGs initiative. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like now to ask His Excellency Mr. Ban Ki-moon to deliver his remarks. Thank you, uh, Mr. Christoph Haider, uh, ECCK President. And also thank you, uh, Chairman uh, Lorenzo uh, Simonelli, uh, for your warm introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished business leaders, uh, I send you a warm welcome and hope you continue to be healthy uh, during these very challenging times uh, caused by COVID-19. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank again the ECCK for inviting me again. Uh, to speak today, as well as for organizing this webinar uh, series. I have a deep admiration and uh, respect for all what you have been doing. Throughout my entire life, I have been fighting uh, for a better world. During my time as UN Secretary General, I was proud to fight for the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. The SDGs were adopted in, on September 25th, uh, 9, uh, 2015, and by all the 193 member states of the United Nations. I still believe that this was by far one of the most historic and far-reaching visions the United Nations has ever presented uh, to the whole world's people. There were MDGs in 2000, but that was uh, limited to uh, developing countries, but SDG covers whole spectrums of our life and our societies. In that regard, um, SDG must be achieved by 2030, but now there are only less than 10 years left to fulfill their promises of leaving no one behind leaving no one behind. This is a philosophical a motto that there should be nobody left behind, regardless of, of what you are, whether you are living in developing and developed world, whether you are rich or poor, whether you are a person of sexually different oriented persons or whatever, whatever criteria there may be, there should be nobody left behind. Please allow me to be blunt. Blunt, I don't think we have been doing enough until now. Despite many ambitious projects, a variety of meaningful initiatives, and plethora of in innovative new approaches, we have failed so far in creating an impactful transition and to a new sustainable life. This is because of the lack of respect for multilateralism. During last at least the four years, multilateralism has been in disarray. Some people say that it was under attack, under threat. Now that with the new administration in the United States, multilateralism is now back, not fully, but it is coming back. So it is a very good opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't have a second chance. We have to act now. Further inaction on the UN Sustainable Development Goals in 
is simply not an option. It is something we must do. We must do. That's why I'm so pleased that in this webinar series, global business leaders like yourselves will share your experiences and your commitments with us. Governments alone cannot do alone. Government cannot do all. This is what I have been repeated it thousand, thousand times as a Secretary General, now as a former Secretary General. There should be a stronger partnership, tripartnership, tripartite partnership, governments, business leaders, and civil societies. When they have forged such a stronger partnership, I think there's nothing which, which we cannot do. This is what I'm, I'm really asking. We need to count on the private sector like yourselves to help drive further success. And we will all benefit from robust vision and action by companies to set the right sustainable business strategies and corporate culture. We also need strong CEOs like yourselves, who has a strong commitment, first of all, and vision to ensure your employees believe in the guiding importance of the sustainable development goals and help channel their energy towards them. I, I've been telling the people that I'm a missionary of uh, climate change as well as a sustainable development. You must be the missionary of your company and your colleagues. So you can speak out to your colleagues and to your people who are working for your company. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, just a few weeks ago, the Yonsei University here in Seoul and I myself hosted the Global Engagement and Empowerment Forum in which experts from all over the world exchange the timely views about the SDGs. It is essential and of outstanding importance that we continuously and actively raise the significance of the transformative promise of the Sustainable Development Goals and also Paris Climate Change Agreement. As you know, among 17 Sustainable Development Goals, there is one goal number 13, that is about the climate change. Because of the importance of uh, this uh, climate issue, when member states were negotiating, they were negotiating on 16 goals, although except climate change. Climate change has been put on different set, track, track. This is um, international treaty negotiation track. And all remaining 16 sustainable development goals are political declaration, political commitment. This is not legal, but you must implement. But when it comes to Paris Climate Change Agreement, this is legal. This is a treaty signed by 196 state parties, more than members of the United Nations. And therefore, I'm asking you really to uh, put priority on implementing climate change agreement. When you plan some business projects, just to think about what kind of impact, what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, impact will your project and new project will have. As I said earlier, I'm encouraged by the new US administration just on the very first day, President Biden has declared rejoined, rejoining this Paris Climate Change Agreement. It has become effective now, legally effective as of 19th of February, just four days ago. So US is now a full member and we can count on their continuing leadership. Ladies and gentlemen, SDG, and give us a plan for a brighter future, and we must succeed. We don't have a plan B because we don't have plan it B. This is what I have been always repeatedly saying. At the same time, 
we, we must bear in mind that the world after COVID-19 should be different. Every country, every country is now spending astronomical amount of money, including South Korea. They are now talking about fourth, um, fourth giving out to uh, people, uh, but it is, it is good, it is necessary to spend money at this time, but please never put climate package in the back seat. It should always be in the front seat together with um, addressing the climate, I mean, uh, COVID-19. COVID-19 is caused because of a lack of our efforts to address our nature, climate change. These are just the two sides of one coin. If we have we done properly more on climate issues, we would not be suffering from this COVID-19. This is one big and important lesson which we have to learn. We have to make sure that we should build back better from this COVID-19. Build back greener, build back better, particularly based on sustainability and in partnership. In this regard, I really thank you for your ongoing efforts and wish you continued success and prosperity in spite of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Let us work together to make this world sustainable and better for others. It is your and my moral and political responsibility to make sure that our succeeding generations will never, will not suffer again from this COVID-19. Thank you very much. These have been the days that will shape us. People don't really understand it until you actually see it. Our industry. Our communities. Our planet. Responding to crisis, we've adapted beyond what we thought possible. But even more change is coming. We need to meet our net zero targets. Develop and deploy new technologies and continue to deliver safe and reliable energy. How do we do what's needed for today and build what's needed for tomorrow? We believe the answer lies within us. An industry always in transition, solving complex problems to power the world. We believe you must know energy to change energy. Rethink how we get there. Redefine what is possible. Renew our collective purpose. Let's take energy forward together. Good morning to our friends here in Korea and the wider Asia region, and hello to our participants from other parts of the world. I'm Sven Eric Battenberg, Director of Legal and International Affairs here at ECCK, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. It'll be a true pleasure to kick off today's SDG webinar series with this conversation with Mr. Lorenzo Simonelli, Chairman, President, and CEO of Baker Hughes which is a Fortune 500 energy technology company active in more than 120 countries and employing 8,500 individuals globally. Now, as an Italian national with a business and economics degree from Cardiff University, Lorenzo fully embodies the European spirit. Lorenzo has an extensive career in GE, having served as executives in many highly cyclic, cyclical industries. This experience has made him particularly well positioned to lead Baker Hughes through the merger, as well as the challenges in the oil sector in 2017. For this webinar, Lorenzo will be joined by, Mr. by Ms. Alison Anderson Book, Vice President of Energy Transition at Baker Hughes. And Alison will share a few minutes of deeper technical discussion on the relevant SDGs in the middle of Lorenzo's presentation. Now, with that being said, um, let's 
cut straight to Lorenzo. Lorenzo, take it away, please. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be with you all. And I just wanted to say what a great opening from the His Honorable Excellence Ban Ki-moon, who really spoke about sustainability. And it's great to be with you all. And thank you to the ECCK for having us. We will spend time today on addressing how our strategy connects and aligns to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And I'm looking forward to the Q&A session afterwards. I wanna start by introducing you to Baker Hughes through our purpose and values. We make energy safer, cleaner, and more efficient for people and the planet. We also are working to ensure that more people have access to affordable and reliable energy. We advance our purpose through our values and that shapes how we work. At the most basic level, our values of grow, collaborate, lead, and care are the embodiment of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. I'll take some time today to walk you through some of the ways we live our values through the work that we do that also underpins the goals of the United Nations. As a signatory of the UN Global Compact, we support the Paris Climate Agreement and believe that individuals, corporations, and all national governments must collaborate to achieve the goals of that landmark agreement. The global energy sector in general and the oil and gas industry must pursue a path to net zero carbon emissions by mid-century. We are positioning Baker Hughes as the leading energy technology company to help enable the energy transition, supporting our customers' efforts to reduce their carbon footprint with a range of emissions reduction products. At Baker Hughes, our success in enabling the energy transition is carried out by every person. We don't have one leader on one energy transition. In our company, we all lead with the actions as an outgrowth of our values. First and foremost, Baker Hughes is an energy technology company. Taking energy forward is part of our growth strategy. We're committed to our own energy transition and that of societies. We are bringing our core technology capabilities to enable a path to net zero for energy and other industrial sectors. We are addressing the climate change challenge by reducing our own emissions as we develop technological solutions that help our customers reduce their emissions. In January 2019, Baker Hughes was among the first in the oil and gas industry to make a commitment to reduce our carbon equivalent emissions 50% by 2030 and to achieve net zero carbon equivalent emissions by 2050 in line with the Paris Climate Agreement. Our ESG and energy transition priorities are reflected in our strategy as a company. We are transforming our core operations, investing for growth in critical areas like digital transformation and non-metallic materials and positioning for new frontiers in hydrogen, CCUS, energy storage, and more. Our strategy is guiding us to achieve our goals and we are well on our way. We see three hard truths to achieve a net zero future. Without alignment on these, we cannot hope to achieve the commitments we all made and are reflected in the UN's SDGs. Firstly, technology alone will not get our society to net zero. We need major acceleration to deploy carbon mitigation technologies faster. We need to see clear signals from governments that they are truly committed to a low carbon society. They can incentivize a more rapid deployment of technologies through a mix of funding and policies that support the outcome-driven solutions in line with the Paris Agreement. Clearly put, the outcome is a low carbon future agnostic of the fuel type. Secondly, the world needs a dynamic energy mix. We need to focus less on picking winners and losers in the energy space, for example, phasing out fossil fuels, and instead focus on making all energy low to zero carbon. There are many reasons that underscore the importance of a broad energy mix, but I'll reference three key points. The energy transition will play out over decades and oil and gas will continue to be an important part of the global energy mix, even under aggressive low carbon scenarios. Policies aimed at driving the energy transition should focus on the goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions 
while meeting global energy demand rather than on promoting a specific future energy mix. While developed parts of the world generally have a robust dynamic energy mix, it is important to remember that developing nations do not yet have the same. They also may not have the financial resources or workforce to deploy fully decarbonized energy, such as renewables at scale to meet their growing energy demands. As such, I wanna emphasize the need to provide a range of decarbonizing solutions for all types of economies and communities around the world that are safe, sustainable, and affordable. As climate is changing in real time around the world, we need and will need more options for sustainable and reliable energy, coupled with strong infrastructure for delivery of energy, whether power lines or pipelines. Thirdly, the path to net zero takes a whole of society commitment and execution to achieve the emissions reduction goals of the Paris Agreement. At Baker Hughes, we work with customers, academia, environmental groups, local and national governments to align to this common goal so that we can enable energy transition market creation. These truths shape our approach to sustainability in how we operate and provide solutions for customer, but also in how we interact with and operate in communities. These truths drive honest and direct dialogues with policymakers Partnership and collaboration is how we can enable new market creation for sustainable energy solutions. The image on the right side of the slide speaks to the technical readiness of emissions reduction solutions. We do not yet have deployment of enough emissions reduction technology solutions to meet our net zero goals. There is a long road to develop and deploy the full solution set. At Baker Hughes, we're working on solutions that will help to lower emissions today, as well as solutions that will allow us to transition to a net zero emissions world by 2050. I'll speak to our solutions more in a moment. I believe that Baker Hughes is uniquely positioned to provide technologies and solutions that help our customers lower their carbon footprint. As you know, most of the major oil companies have laid out plans to aggressively lower their carbon footprint by 2030 with a goal of net zero by 2050, consistent with our stated emissions reduction goal. Our strategy in this area is focused on, one, providing a range of solutions targeting near-term emissions reductions for existing assets and infrastructure. Secondly, technology development across multiple new frontiers that can help drive lower carbon emissions. For near-term decarbonization efforts, we have a range of solutions available today that can lower carbon emissions. Examples include upgrades to existing turbines to operate more efficiently and reduce emissions, a range of products that can detect, monitor, and reduce methane emissions, scaling our remote operations technology for multiple applications which can be utilized to reduce fuel consumption by significantly lowering travel requirements. For longer term decarbonization opportunities, we see the greatest potential in carbon capture use and storage, hydrogen, geothermal energy, energy storage, and we are working to take LNG to net zero. This outward facing strategy for our customers is aligned to how we work and support the UN SDGs. At Baker Hughes, we align our sustainability strategy to the UN Sustainable Development Goals through our commitment to people, planet, and principles. I'll walk you through several examples of how we're working to meet the SDGs using our sustainable themes. For those of you who think in terms of E, S, and G, the E for environment is our planet. The S for social is our people, and the G for governance is our principles. I'm going to start with people. The people area covers the more socially focused part of sustainability. This includes diversity, culture, fair labor practices, equitable pay, employee volunteerism, community engagement, leadership programs, and more. On this slide, 
there are four titles at the upper right that show the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And we have aligned to our four people themes. The information I'm showing is from our 2009 Corporate Responsibility Report. The selected information speaks to our commitment on inclusion and diversity. We are working to ensure that we have diversity of all kinds the diversity that we can see and also the kind that we cannot see. This includes gender, racial, cultural, neurodiversity, and persons with disabilities. Before I go on, I would like to acknowledge that the energy sector still has a big challenge on employing a more diverse workforce, particularly as it relates to gender. We are no exception and have identified this as a major priority area in our sustainable performance. We are taking actions to address this through different initiatives inside and outside of the company. I want to focus on SDG goal number five, aimed at achieving gender equality and empowering all women and girls. This is a challenge that I have taken on personally, starting at the top of our organization. I have worked to increase the diversity of my leadership team and that of the Baker Hughes Board of Directors. 31% of executive leadership team are women. 33% of our board of directors are women. Let's take a moment and dig a little deeper. Creating an inclusive and diverse workforce goes far beyond numbers. In our company, we know that we cannot retain a talented, diverse workforce without engaging employees and fostering a talent pipeline through our range of different initiatives. With respect to gender diversity, we have several notable programs aid that talent development, recruitment, leadership development, and retention of women. Let's start with early engagement. With a South Korean example, in South Korea, our women's network partners with the Center for Women in Science, Engineering, and Technology to host a mentoring program for female engineering and science students. The Global Mentoring Program was an initiative started by a women's network team in Korea in partnership with the Center of Women in STEM, a public organization supported by the Korean Ministry of Science and ICT to foster and nurture female talent in STEM. Baker Hughes officially started participating in 2017. Every year, Baker Hughes employs in Korea volunteer as mentors for female university students in science and engineering recruited by YSET. Through continuous mentoring, career coaching, panel discussions, mock interviews, technology seminars, facility tours, and team projects, our mentors have provided coaching on how to succeed in the workplace as a woman in STEM and showed them what it means to work for an energy technology company, creating a support network for students still exploring their career options. The next phase of our approach is aimed at early career engagement. We recruit and develop young leaders through two programs, Aspire and Cultivate. Aspire, our early career development program, focuses on accelerating the careers of recent graduates, male and female, and entry level professionals over a two year period. The program has a global footprint with eight functional tracks. Cultivate is a 12 month program dedicated to developing high potential female leadership skills through tailored experiences and senior one on one mentorship. The purpose and mission of the Cultivate program is to build a female leadership pipeline with a focus on inclusion and diversity. Finally, we engage women throughout the organization at all levels through our women's network. In 2020, the Women's Network ran events to help our employees adapt to new working conditions, creating healthy work boundaries, and ran sessions on how to maintain our human connections in a virtual world. Their focus in 2021 is to continue their mentoring programs and building processes to enable members and allies to identify their mentoring needs. The Women's Network also works to lead career growth through purposeful programming to take women in energy forward. The pandemic has placed a serious strain, several distinct groups of people, disproportionately impacting working women and working single parents. 
We have worked to ensure flexible work hours and locations to allow our employees to manage demands at home with work. Our learning and development team hosted a number of sessions to help our employees adapt to a change in environment from how to be stay at home teacher to regular yoga, meditation and workout sessions to ensure we are looking after our physical and mental health. As you can see, we are very committed to empowering and growing women well beyond the borders of our company. At the outset of this talk, I outlined our commitment to the energy transition and our commitment to net zero emissions. I wanna briefly take you through our progress on our climate actions, which aligns to goal 13. To date, we have made a 31.6% reduction in our scope one and two emissions versus our baseline year. Some, but not all our emission reductions have come by switching our operational power consumption to renewable power where we can. We are also focusing on emissions reductions through efficiency improvements, changes to our fleet and how we travel and more. We've made strong progress, but we still have a long journey to net zero in our future. As an energy technology manufacturer, we're committed to understanding and reducing the full scope one, two, and three of our emissions. But it starts with understanding the magnitude of our scope three emissions. Also known as the value chain emission, scope three includes all of our indirect greenhouse gas emissions that occur in a company's value chain, upstream and downstream of our operations. This includes emissions from the production of raw materials and semi-finished goods the companies buys and the transportation and the use of products and services it sells. It's worth stating the obvious. You must measure before you mitigate. Otherwise, a solution may not align with the problem. In line with that thinking, our emissions excellence team has prioritized scope-free measurement working with our sourcing team to understand how our 60,000 plus suppliers are tackling their emissions. This provides us with a full understanding of where we need to focus our efforts in emissions reductions and helps us to identify preferred suppliers that operate most sustainably. This year, we will continue to expand our scope-free reporting and we are undertaking an analysis on how we can reduce all scopes of emissions over our value chain, both upstream and downstream with our customers. For our products and services in the field, we undertake emissions analysis to discover where we can most effectively and efficiently lower the emissions footprint of operations for our customers. We have a joint industry project underway to understand how the field performance of our products impacts our customers' emissions. In this partnership, we conduct emissions lifecycle analysis for our products to understand where emissions lie cradle to grave, and to develop strategies to reduce them. As you can see, we are very committed to empowering and growing beyond on emissions. In addition to emissions reductions, we are focused on enabling the production of affordable and clean energy in line with SDG goal seven. We accomplish this by looking for solutions to make all forms of the energy more sustainable. There are a few examples here I'd like to illustrate on how we're transforming what we make, how we make it and supply it, and how we work overall. First, moving away from the metals, minerals usage in our supply chain to composite materials and thermoplastics. Second, we are designing products that use less raw material in manufacturing, have a smaller physical footprint and a lighter, which allows us to lower the emissions associated with mobilization of a product to its deployment site. Third, we are utilizing additive manufacturing to reduce waste and weight and produce paths on our demand. As a result, we can print a part locally and avoid mobilizing the same type of part from a warehouse, manufacturing site, or another continent. Finally, we have embraced circularity in our supply chains to reduce the amount of raw materials that we have to source and reduce waste at the end of the product's life. Our drill bits are designed to be refurbished and reused many times before they are retired, back into the melt and turned into new drill bits. Over 95% of the materials in a drill bit are reused and recycled. As you can see, 
we are very committed to empowering and growing the use of recycled material. Diving a little deeper in how we are transforming how we work and that of our customers work. In 2020, we saw accelerated deployment of remote operations and automation. The pandemic has forced many companies to move into remote operations, our company included. We moved a significant proportion of our workforce to fully remote working settings. For our customers, we have seen increased adoption of remote operations over the last year, with nearly 90% 90 of our drilling jobs being performed remotely in 2020, which is up more than 50% from 2019. We have also a partnership with C3.ai called BHC Free that leverages machine learning and AI to optimize facility energy use. It's now been a year and a half since we announced our investment in C3.ai and launched BHC Free. This partnership is a testament to our commitment to bring a differentiated approach to supporting our customers' digital transformation agendas and help meet the growing demand for AI solutions in our markets. We view AI as a positive driver for sustainability and the applications can continue to grow in the future. Health, safety and the environmental excellence is a core part of our operating culture, both at Baker Hughes sites and where our employees work at customer and partner locations. Our perfect HSE day remains the cornerstone of our HSE efforts and we celebrate every work day we complete that are free of injuries, accidents or cause no harm to the environment. We achieved 161 perfect HSE days in 2019, a 5% increase from the prior year. Our total recordable incident rate improved by 12.5% versus the prior year and is 68% lower than the average for our industry. Safe operations are essential for our company. In 2020, we did not let down our guard on safety, even with the shift to remote operations and work from home. We continue to maintain our vigilance and focus on the safety and health of our employees wherever they worked. This helped reduce the spread of COVID-19 through our facilities. We also have a strong focus on ethics and compliance. We empower our employees to own their ethics and integrity commitment and have a greater than 95% compliance rate for our annual ethics and compliance training. We ensure that integrity and compliance is a foundational element of our culture and a business priority. We set high expectations outlined in our code of conduct and reinforced through our leadership. I wanna close by highlighting a particularly important impactful program at Baker Hughes, our Supplier Social Responsibility Program. As a part of Baker Hughes' commitment to safe workplaces, equitable play, and fair labor practices, we developed the Supplier Social Responsibility Program. Currently, 100% of our global suppliers are assessed for social risks, and we perform site visits to suppliers around the world to ensure that they use safe and equitable practices in how they work and treat their employees. The in-person site visits are risk-based, so we begin with an assessment of the supplier to identify those that might be high risk, then deploy people to conduct those audits. In 2020, we moved from in-person supplier audits to remote which were conducted through virtual visits to ensure the safety of our people and our suppliers in the time of the pandemic. This program allows us to reinforce our values and focus on sustainability well beyond the operations we control from day to day, expanding our influence to 60,000 plus companies, suppliers around the world. I will now hand it over to Alison Anderson Book, our Vice President of Energy Transition to briefly discuss how we will continue to move our sustainable business practices forward in 2020 and beyond. Over to you, Alison. Thanks, Lorenza. Um, uh, I'm gonna focus uh, just for a short time on one, one slide in particular that will, will, will come up in a minute here. And what this is gonna show is actually our approach in how we are tackling all of the sustainable development goals that we've committed to. And, we haven't taken them all on uh, as some things are not really within the framework of how our company operates and where we operate, but for the ones that we do, 
uh, this slide is going to illustrate how we do it and, and sort of what overall approach we have. And so you can drop this into many of the different aspects. So the example that I have here today is one that I think um, our, our host at the front uh, feels fairly passionate about in terms of meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement. And so in this particular example, you'll see nine tiles on the left of the slide. And within that, you'll see the reference to net zero because Lorenzo highlighted already that we made a pretty strong commitment about a year and a half ago on getting to net zero as, as a company by 2050. And so we're currently looking at that roadmap and thinking about how can we get there a little bit faster and what else can we deploy in, in our journey to get to net zero. And so, so each of these areas, so there's the ambition, which we have clearly stated, We've got governance, and I want to speak to the fact that the accountability in the space starts right at the top, and it came from Lorenzo and our board. And so, so hearing it for me as, as a person who sets out on the strategy and then implementing it, without that commitment, uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't go so far as, as fast as we have. And I've spoken about uh, strategy, and a lot of this underpins major changes across a company like ours that's in so many different countries around the world. And so you have to think about how your operating model is going to change. And in this case, uh, one of the one of the, the persons that's attending asked about our what you know what kind of renewable power we use. So we have to look at that across all of our different facilities, which which uh, at the start of last year were well over a thousand. And think about how do we commit to a shift in power where we can. You know, and then are there other ways of transforming our energy mix as Baker Hughes as we go on our journey? And so that, that's the enter enterprise transformation. A big piece of that's supply chain, right? And, and you heard Lorenzo talk about that in our, the, our supplier audit program. We want to start to see a ripple effect go throughout our entire supply chain back up to the first starting point where you see uh, or extracted that eventually ends in, in going into drill bits and turbines that, as you heard, are circular in how we manufacture them. And so, so that's another piece of the transformation. And that gets to innovation, finance, right? So anything that you're doing in this area requires a commitment to finance. But I'd like to note that not everything that you do in the space is, is a net sort of cost. Actually, there's a very large back-end savings that comes from operating efficiently and in many cases the shift to renewables actually has somewhat of a cost advantage in some markets and so so we've got the financing that actually can help us think about working efficiently on the emission side and to some degree in in our operating model at transparency is is what we're doing today and we continue to really show our work and a little bit more with each passing year and so Again, you heard the example that Lorenzo gave talking about our commitment to gender, gender equity, and diversity in the workplace. We own the fact that it's a very hard challenge for our sector, and we're really trying to advance that, and we're going to talk about our journey along the way as, as we were to get there. And the last piece, piece is engagement. I mean, you can say it one time, you can say it a hundred times, but technology doesn't get us there on its face to net zero. It takes a whole of commitment with many different sectors and partners, a commitment from people like, like Ban Ki-moon at the front in his, his Paris Agreement, in, in, the, in the deal that he brokered there, that's, that's collaboration. And it takes everybody coming to the table to do that. And so, so this is how we're really thinking about pursuing the, the advancement of the sustainable development goals. And, and on the right, and then I'll close and hand it back to Lorenzo, We've got some other themes that we're really thinking about as new growth areas for us to, to, to dive into that are a part of the SDGs that we didn't talk about. And so we'll continue to look at our technology solutions, which, which he did talk about, but waste reduction in particular, it's not just circularity, it's, it's finding alternative uses for waste and actually cutting down our footprint substantially. That helps us reduce our emissions. Taking our water usage down, that's a really big area for, for the UN's SDGs. And you've heard about supplier accountability, but in community engagement, we do a lot of work through our foundation, as well as a volunteer projects across the company in many different geographies around the world. And so, so that's kind of where we're headed. And I invite people who are listening, if you have any questions on that, we can dive a little bit deeper, or otherwise follow up with myself or Lorenzo, and we'll talk, a little bit, we'll talk to you a little bit more about the approach that we're using and not just net zero, but committing to all of our sustainable development goals. And I'm going to hand it back to you, Lorenzo, for the Q&A.
Thank you very much, Alison, and uh, I appreciate the time we had today to share our approach at Baker Hughes, and our entire team is excited in the role we must play in a net zero future and supporting the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. With that, I'll pass it over to questions. I think we have a few minutes for uh, anything uh, that's come up. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Lorenzo and Alison. This is uh, this is very, this is terrific. I, I really appreciate you taking us through all this and I'm very happy to say that we have some questions from the audience as well. So this is good. Now, if you allow me, I want to start off with um, the question. The title of the webinar is leading ESG strategy for the energy, for the energy industry. Now you talk a lot about the need for collaboration and purely any, any activities from government are insufficient. Now, very simply put, do you think there's globally sufficient progress made in the field of SDGs? And what can, I mean, you are a driver, you've shown in the slides that you have made tremendous efforts, but what can be done both by you, industry wider, and governments to further drive this, to reach to sustainability, to, to the, the efforts, that, to the sustainable efforts that we all need to have made? Sven, it's a great question and um, I'll uh, jump in and give you my opinion and allow Alison also to give hers given that she also comes from uh, more of a government background and agencies. But I think it really does require a coming together of all the different stakeholders and also having a basis of understanding of what outcome we're looking for, which is really the SDG goals to be met. And that means we have to be innovative in applying new technology, but also practical in the way in which we meet some of those targets. And I think uh, a lot of education needs to happen, a lot of coming together, and we have to be on the same team. And that's the most important thing between all the stakeholders. But uh, Alison? So, so with respect to the government piece of this, I think that, that um, governments are really just getting started, right? We're hearing a lot of commitments that are made, but but we've got to we've got to make sure that, that that governments put their money where their mouth is, so to speak, and and actually put the put the necessary investment behind it because it's the investment's going to be a lot bigger than what people think it will be to get to a full market deployment. As, as Lorenzo showed in one of the slides that had it was the grid that had the technical ready readiness level of tech today. That was an IEA. Um, study that showed there's about only a third that's really ready today. I mean, thankfully, Baker Hughes has a lot of that in our, in our portfolio, but there's a ways to go. And, and so it's, we've got to have, we've got to have the backing of different levels of government around the world. And we're, we're, we've got a strong start that we leveraged off of the back of the UN and the Paris Agreement. But, but we've got to dig in a little bit deeper and it takes more than just Baker Hughes to, to, to join that join that commitment. We, we want to bring all of our customers and partners there with us. No, excellent. Yeah, fully agree. And in this regard, as you, as you alluded to, the, the fact that there are green deals in the EU, in Korea, and now also uh, in the US, uh, that, that certainly should help. Um, now there, as you said, putting your money where your mouth is, uh, it's good to have uh, a lot of spending made. But if I, if I were to summarize what you're saying, there there would need to be a reassessment of the budgets that are made available under all those three deals as to whether that is still sufficient in five years or even now at this point. Okay, now then let me jump to a question uh, from the audience, which I think touches on nicely here. It's from Andre Norton. Um, there, as we've recently witnessed, and the people at Baker Hughes headquarters even more so than people elsewhere in the world, um, the energy industry met a serious crisis in Houston, Texas. Um, are there at this point already some early learnings for your industry from this complex situation, uh, which could either help or slow down sustainable transformation? Andre, having lived through what happened in uh, Houston, Texas the last week and uh, you know, gone without power for two days and gone without water. I think it just shows the fragileness of the infrastructure that's in place and also how we need to work together and be practical on the solutions. Um, clearly, the freezing temperatures gave light to the inability to have renewable wind turbines actually running during the cold. Uh, there wasn't enough gas power to be able to supplement and the infrastructure wasn't there. I think what it tells us is, as we go through, in particular, an energy transition, 
it's got to be a roadmap that is logical, practical, and also can continue to provide sustainable, affordable, reliable energy. Because at the end of the day, that's what's required by everybody. And if you think of today, we still have over a billion people that don't have access to electricity. Last week in Texas, you had over 13 million households that didn't have electricity. Now, you can't have costs that escalate. And as you've seen some of the prices that are being mentioned during that uh, winter storm are egregious and thousands of dollars uh, people being receiving bills. There has to be a transition that makes sense utilizing CCUS, utilizing natural gas, and how do we decarbonize and reduce the carbon footprint of the hydrocarbons that can be used today as we innovate and also develop the infrastructure of storage for renewables as we develop hydrogen. And I think it just is a further illustration of, you know, this is a complex problem and we need to work together to address it, but it's not just ban hydrocarbons and it's not just uh, go all one way or the other. There needs to be a practical solution. Okay, oh, very good. Um, now you, throughout the presentation, you also talked about deploying, uh, well, basically technology to further, further develop things. And now I'd like to look a bit more further in the future and specifically as to the singularity of artificial intelligence, basically when AI systems become smarter than humans. Now, this may arrive uh, within a decade, it might be sooner, it might be later, there are different views on this, and I'm not going to ask you what your opinion is, but regardless of when this will be, um, there there's going to be changes in many industries and also, of course, in the energy industry. Now, you mentioned that you're focused on designing, manufacturing, and services, servicing transformative technologies uh, and help to take everything forward. But what are your thoughts on, on this, uh, on the future for the energy industry, particularly with AI's um, potential of, of running rampant? So I look at it as, as an opportunity. And um, if you look at the energy industry and you look at um, the actual value change, there is a lot of waste today of non-productive time, of inefficiencies. And we have an opportunity through data analytics, artificial intelligence to improve that efficiency and also to drive more remote operations. Also, the places that many of our employees have to go to to actually conduct the service are not the most hospitable. So we have an opportunity also to reskill and deploy more software engineers, uh, have more remote centers and operations from a central location, demand the platforms. And so I view AI as actually an upskilling opportunity of our current workforce, uh, redeploying them to further value added software engineering and an opportunity to drive efficiencies. And it will take some time, uh, but uh, it's necessary for us as it's also more difficult today to attract people to the energy industry. Okay, very good. Now then being mindful that- uh, yep, Sam, can, I, can I add what Lorenzo said? We actually have this amazing partnership and, and they just put out a big call for proposals for people to apply. I'm gonna drop that in the chat window, but it's this great initiative that C3, who's, who Lawrence has spoken to AI here, has been putting on through this, this digital institute to really foster the use of AI and a lot of different sort of energy, natural resource paradigm. And it, it would be a shame if people missed an opportunity to really latch on and see what that's about. So I'm gonna put that in the chat for anyone who's listening, because it's a really cool initiative. It's a good call out. And, um, we are receiving submissions now for the digital transformation and, and, and AI for energy and climate sustainability. Perfect, very good. Now, thank you for, for raising this, Alison. This, this makes a lot of sense. Now, if I, if I can close on a bit of a, a challenging uh, question. Um, Alison put uh, forward that many, uh, many governments need to as I said, put the money where their mouth is. Now, what we've seen is from companies becoming more green, there's also, unfortunately, a lot of claims of companies being green, being, uh, being indicated as, as greenwashing. Now, as you, as you pointed at the slides, you've, you've done a lot as, as Baker Hughes to really put the money where your mouth is. But this is, again, not done throughout industry. What, what are your thoughts that, that can be done to avoid false claims and to really stop 
the, uh, the consumers being numbed with claims about being green and not, believe, not believing them because of those, those greenwashing uh, activities by some companies. So Sven, I think you're starting to see it already. And uh, look, uh, it's important that people break down their roadmaps towards net zero. And you're starting to see more calls from external agencies, from the investor base on actually, what are the practical steps you can undertake to get to net zero? Uh, we know that uh, you start small and you build a roadmap, and that's what we're doing at Baker Hughes, and that's why we've achieved the 31% reductions from our baseline to, uh, in the last few years. So I think um, you are starting to see people wary that it's just greenwashing, and I think you're, you're going to continue to see more external agencies uh, request the reporting on it, and it's part of the reporting that we do in our sustainability report. So transparency, really actually not giving vague answers, but really once you have something showing how that is, in, how that is affected, following the roadmap that you have laid out. Correct. Excellent. No, very good. I, I said I'm aware that, that we are running towards the top of the hour, so I don't want to keep you much longer. Um, I, I would really like to express our, our appreciation for you being available for this inaugural session. It was a true pleasure of having you and, and Alison with us. And I hope it certainly is the same for you as well. It is definitely. And um, I look forward in the future to uh, meeting in person. I thank everybody for joining us. And uh, again, I think uh, we had his honorable excellency give a great outset speech that this is a journey we're all on together. And from the standpoint of Baker Hughes, we're here as an energy technology company to enable the quest towards net zero and look forward to working with all of you. Thank you very much. Now for the people at home and perhaps also for you, Lorenzo, um, we, we already have scheduled the next session, which will be on March 11. And for that one, we will have Ms. Saori Duborg, member of the executive board of BASF uh, join us. Um, and I certainly hope that uh, there are big shoes to fill after this inaugural session, but I am quite sure she will do a great job as well. Lorenzo, thank you again, stay safe and see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you all, stay safe.